Okay, very good. Douglas, if you want to start sharing your screen. Okay, perfect. So we are very, very pleased to have Douglas Higginbotham from Jefferson Lab here today um, to speak with us at, about the proton radius puzzle. And um, Douglas is a senior scientist at JLab, and he's also the uh, director of the Electron Ion Collider Center and wrangler of EIC fellows like me. <laughs> anyway, Douglas, thanks for being here, please. Oh, thank you for inviting me. And, and I asked Jennifer what I should speak on. And after we went back and forth, I said, how about a fun talk? And she said, of course. So we ended up on proton radius. And uh, I left it as a question. If we're at the end of this puzzle, and I'll, I'll leave it to you all to decide. And scattered throughout this talk are a number of uh, XKCD comics. I love them. Um, and they're also often funny. And it, as this is giving a hint, there'll be a lot of talk about statistics, statistical analysis, and, and some of the pitfalls we, we all fall into uh, doing regressions machine learning, other other things. So we will touch on that as part of this talk. All right. So if there's puzzle, something had to cause it, and it really goes back to two very tenacious graduate students, um, now professors, so Randolph and Aldo, um, working very hard to do muonic lamb shift measurements. And they worked extremely hard along with their collaboration trying to see signals. They would work with their setup and they would see absolutely nothing. They assumed it was a problem with their setup. Scanning, scanning, seeing nothing. It's getting to the last night of the experiment. Time running out, no signal, no result. Senior scientists gather together and go, well, we've been scanning around 0.88 femtometer equivalent in frequency. We should go to a larger radius. Uh, in GoSick, others were thought the, the number might be higher, 0.92. So senior scientists all agreed that's what shall be done. Well, that night with two graduate students on shift, they decided, well, we'd kind of looked at those higher frequencies before. And they went in exactly the opposite direction than their elders told them to go. Typical thing for young people to do. And wow, they hit the resonant frequency of the signal. All the problems they'd been having wasn't because their apparatus had any issues whatsoever. It's that they were scanning in the wrong place. And it was a very narrow signal with an excellent setup. So this is their data. You don't need a curve fitting program to look at this and look down into three significant figures, pull off the frequency. They did it to four. Beautiful result. And when they took the frequency that they measured, converted it to a radius, they got the now very famous result of 0.84 femtometers. And that was quite a difference given the precision of the previous results at 0.88 femtometers. And this made the cover of nature and started the puzzle. So 2011, this is a slide I've used for many years. I thought it was very nice just because I just look back. So what were all those possible explanations a decade ago? Was the experiment wrong? It's not an unreasonable thing to ask, especially when you see such a large systematic difference from what you're expecting. Is there something wrong with the theory? Two photon corrections? quantum electrodynamics, electroweak, right? Is that guy go from a frequency to a radius? So I, there is a model. Is something wrong here? Maybe there was something wrong with the standard lamb shift theory, the exciting one. Something beyond the standard model is going on. And then the one at the time was probably least on people's list. Maybe both the hydrogen uh, lamb shift experiment and electron scattering experiments were wrong for some reason. Um, but this would affect the Rydberg constant, uh, could be two photon corrections, etc. A lot of effort went into this, uh, probably by several of you on this call. I know John worked 
a lot on this. Digging into these various aspects. And a lot of things over the years just turned out to be not an issue. Uh, the experiment uh, was repeated, no problem. A lot of effort has gone into the theory, refining it, improving uh, the extraction, but nothing significant has changed. Uh, many ideas about standard, beyond standard model physics have come. Uh, most have gone at this point. Okay, so I'm going to dig in today on the electron scattering side of what happened. How did we determine the proton radius from the electron scattering? So I'm going to show you a few figures on how we did that, why there's something special about the very light nuclei compared to heavy when extracting a radius, and I'll show some of the techniques uh, people used over the years to pull the radius out of the experimental data. It was a little more challenging than this case where I got a frequency, it's pretty easy to go to my theoretical friends and pull out the radius from that frequency. So how do we do these electron scattering measurements? Of course, I need my beam of electrons. So nowadays you'd come to Jefferson Lab or Mainz, for example, uh, very nice beams. Foils are amazing. Easy to determine thickness before and after the experiment. But for electron scattering from hydrogen, I'm typically going to use a cryogenic target. It is possible to use plastics. Um, they're challenging. They melt very easily. So go-to target uh, tends to be cryogenic, uh, liquid hydrogen. One of the problems with those targets, it's extremely hard to determine the thickness precisely at least down to the sub 1% level. Uh, this ends up with lots of details about putting a beam through a material inside an aluminum can that you've cooled. In order to keep that can pressurized, the ends are curved, so small deviations in the angle of the beam, de deformations of the metal as it's cooled. There's all kinds of things come in as you try to get down below uh, 1% in determining thickness. And since the experiments wish to push beyond 1% level, often they use floating normalizations when fitting their data. Uh, elastic scattering kinematics can be overdetermined. So if I know my beam energy, I measure the energy of the scattered electron and the angle, the reaction is overdetermined. This makes it relatively clean. Uh, oftentimes, magnetic spectrometers are used, uh, though not always. And the big exception there is the PRAD experiment that came out just a couple years ago. They did not use a magnetic spectrometer. A lot of details goes into the tracking and understanding your magnetic fields if I'm going to use a spectrometer. And just to give a picture of a spectrometer, um, this is Jefferson Lab Hall A. Um, it was about a decade ago. This is me with more hair. Um, but giant device. This is set up for a polarized helium 3 target, but beam coming in your target and then you have your large spectrometer for detecting scattered particles. So electron in, we put a hydrogen target here, scatter, detect that scattered electron. Now if I want to be naive, I can think in terms of a Fourier transform of an ideal charge distribution. And the simplest thing I could possibly think about is a uniform sphere of charge. So I think of a density in terms of a radius, do a Fourier transform into a charge form factor, and you get beautiful diffractive minima. What is cute about this picture, at least to me, even if I am incredibly naive and go with a uniform sphere of charge instead of something more appropriate like a Wood Saxon potential, if I'm thinking about carbon, this would be a nice representation. As soon as I see these diffractive minima, even in the, the simplest model I can think of, the uniform sphere, I will get the radius right to about 10% immediately. And of course, you would use something more precise to do the extraction. To give you an, an example, and this is an example that has stood the test of time for quite a while, uh, data on carbon uh, from Ingo Sick. Uh, Jim McCarthy from the 70s from Slack, along with National Bureau of Standards low Q squared data done by Larry Cardman. Uh, this is the data. So this is a beautiful high Q squared carbon elastic data. 
So doing that electron scattering experiment, electron in, electron out on carbon foil. Beautifully can see the location of the diffractive minimum. Again, you do this with a ruler. And they combined that with the very low Q squared data done at National Bureau of Standards and extracted the radius of carbon, 2.46 femtometers. This result is not in question, so there is no carbon radius puzzle. There's just proton radius puzzle or light nuclei radius puzzle. Why? The proton doesn't have measured diffractive minima. This whole idea falls apart. It is too light uh, to do the Fourier transport te technique in a model independent way. So what has been going on since Lujan 1963 in extracting proton radii from the experimental data is they make use of this formula. That the slope of the charge form factor at a Q squared of zero multiplied by negative six square root is by definition the radius of the proton. And one extremely important point that many theorists have looked at your two recent papers is this formula consistent with the formula that was used for the extraction of the muonic lamb shift radius and the answer was yes this is absolutely consistent there was no problem in our definitions and this is a definition of, of the radius so from my point of view and the point of view of the data we can obtain I never get my electron scattering data down to exactly a Q squared of zero. Uh, even for the next generation PRAD experiment or experiments going to be done at Mainz, we, we push, we push as low as we can, but we never get to exactly zero. So we have to make an extrapolation, maybe very short, but it's nevertheless an extrapolation. And the floating normalizations I mentioned earlier can complicate the matter. So you can imagine I have some data points and if I could shift the normalization ever so slightly compared to my endpoint, that could shift the radius since it's a slope. So, oops, elastic scattering from spin one half particles, beautifully simple formula. So cross section, MOT, energy of the scattered electron over energy of the beam. I've got my electric magnetic form factors of tau, which is simply Q squared over four mass of proton squared and an angle. From this formula, you can immediately, if you ponder it a little bit, you can immediately see how I can deconvolute from, deconvolute from the experimental data, electric and magnetic form factors. Uh, many experiments uh, have done this, a very recent publication uh, from Hall A on magnetic form factor proton. If I go to large angles, I can dominate this formula by the magnetic term. If I go to lower energies, very small angles, I can dominate by the electric term. And to visualize that, I had one of our students take that total cross section, so take this formula, and then turn off one of the form factors. So total cross section in blue, here we've divided by mot to make it easy to see. So red is if there was only the electric form factor and green is only magnetic. So for a fixed beam energy, this is a low one. So 0.2 GeV, if you go to very small scattering angles, your cross section shall be dominated by the electric form factor. The magnetic hardly plays a role. And if I do the reverse, I go to very large scattering angles, then the magnetic dominates. Or I can go sit in the intermediate range and by measuring, I get contribution from both electric and magnetic. I can do that measurement at two different epsilons and then separate the electric and magnetic contributions. So this is a low, Q, a low energy example. This is now up to 800 MeV. And the story is the same, the kinematics just shift. So very small angles dominated by electric form factor, large angle dominated by the magnetic in that intermediate region where you would do Rosenbluth type separation. And of course, what's beautiful, if I take lots of data, I can do a global analysis and pull out both electric and magnetic form factors simultaneously. Okay, now we get to the fun part. 
Fitting. What the heck does a nuclear physicist need to know about fitting? Chi-squared. We love chi-squared. Take my experimental data, subtract it from the model, divide by sigma, sum it, square it. I have my total chi-squared. Great. Divide by number of degrees of freedom. Got my reduced chi-squared. If it's close to one, I'm good, right? No, I'm going to show you some examples where you're not good. In fact, you're very bad. Uh, and the problem is that this one term, while it can certainly tell you if things have gone horrific, um, doesn't always tell you that things have gone well. And there's certainly many, many pitfalls along the way. Uh, one can be the uncertainties in the data. Often the experimentalists are not just doing, um, their data are not just dominated by one over the square root of n statistical error. There are systematics, there's real life problems. So the weights, the sigmas can be underestimated. They can't even be overestimated. I could be using the wrong model. The data can be not normally distributed, which is actually an ansatz in using this function. Sometimes the average reduced chi-square can be good, but you're overfitting in one region and underfitting in another. All kinds of things can go wrong. And I'm going to show you a very classic example. Uh, this is from a 1973 American statistician paper. And it was done to make a point. So the statistician took a number of data points. So he has 11 points. And he gave them to you in X versus Y. So these are X values with the Y, X values with different Y. And I added uh, delta Y just to make it a little more nuclear physics normal since we often have the error bars. If you take this data and hand it to your statistical analysis routine, it will give you exactly the same chi-square for every single one. If you plot it and look at it, you get this. This looks like what you probably think experimental data that's distributed around a line should look like. So this has a slope of half, intercept of three, chi-squared per degree of freedom is unity. It's beautiful. You can even see roughly a third of the points not touching the line. This looks textbook. Now the other three examples also have exactly the same slope, exactly the same reduced chi-squared, and are pretty silly. All right, we have the frown. This data is clearly not normally distributed. We have the outlier, where a single point is clearly pulling this entire regression to a value. And number four is perhaps the most interesting. Uh, this one's often classified as a poorly designed experiment, where someone has sat here at one x value. You imagine repeating the same measurement over and over and over again. And then they have one point far away. Of course, the one point far away determines the slope. But when you plug in your numbers in a regression routine, it doesn't know it's just one point far away. It assumes the data are normally distributed. So you're not, it would not by default give you the results you're expecting. So just some pitfalls that can hit you with just looking at chi-squared. There's much more you need to look at. And just visualizing the data will often show if there's some egregious problem going on, especially the outlier or perhaps a poorly done experiment. And from XKCD, this is the, as you can see by late next month, you'll have over four dozen husbands. So yesterday, zero, today, one. You can fit that with a line beautifully. Hold on, shouldn't you be using more than two data points? So our handy statistician goes, of course, zero, 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 one. So, oops, you're right. So she's gonna have lots of husbands. This is actually fun to code up. So this is a, just a little fitting routine to do that. It iterates like crazy to find a solution, but it will. It's of course silly. Okay, I show you some silly examples, but this comes up over and over and over again in real life. And it doesn't matter whether we're just doing simple least squares regressions or deep learning. It's all the same idea. You can be underfitting your data, you can be overfitting your data, or you can be just right. And it comes up a lot. Uh, one of the examples that's tough 
can be, I would like my algorithm to determine a gun. I have x-ray machines at the airport. Humans, very quick at seeing a gun in a bag. I'd like to train my computer. If you overtrain the computer, it won't see the gun because the serial number doesn't match or it's not exactly the same type of gun as you trained it on. If you underfit, then everything becomes a gun. Then holding my fingers up comes a gun. So getting to that just right, regardless of whether we're doing uh, nuclear physics, fitting algorithm, or trying to do machine learning so my x-ray machine can automatically determine if a gun's in a bag, it's challenging. To get into this just right is not something trivial. It takes a lot of work. It's very easy to underfit or overfit, though we all wish to sit in this Goldilocks just right region. One of my favorite examples of this comes from Freeman Dyson. When he was young, he had a beautiful theoretical model, at least he thought it was beautiful, and he presented it to Enrico Fermi. He traveled to Chicago to meet his idol, which was Fermi, and Fermi had agreed to meet with him. Dyson comes into Fermi's office, and Fermi very quickly rejects Dyson's work out of hand. And Dyson's blown away. What, what's wrong? And Fermi asked Dyson how many parameters he had used in his model. Dyson counts it up. I had four free parameters. Fermi's answer to that was, with four free parameters, I can fit an elephant. And with five, I can make his trunk wiggle. Dyson rejected, thought really hard about this lesson uh, from Fermi. And the point wasn't being mean. The point was he had put in so many degrees of freedom into his model with so few data points he was fitting, he could have described anything. It no longer had the physics meaning that we all want. And Dyson credits Fermi basically giving me a kick in the pants and getting him set on the right track and onto an amazing career path. And I have a link here. You can go to a uh, web of stories where Dyson was recorded uh, telling this tale in his own words. It also was written up as a nature article. Now, of course, if someone tells you about fitting your uh, five parameter el elephant, in 2010, someone actually came up with a excuse me, four parameter elephant and with the fifth parameter you can make its trunk wiggle. This code is in Python. It's kind of fun to play with to see how they did that. And finally, and this is the pitfall of all of us, uh, regardless whether it's physics or anything else, uh, as humans, there is a danger of confirmation bias, and it's just something we should be aware of, otherwise it will bite us. Um, a very famous example, this is Senator Inhofe, who was on the Science Committee in the Senate, Chair. It had snowed in Washington, D.C. in early spring. He gathered the snow up, goes to the floor of the Senate, and says, See? There's no global warming, and tosses the snowball. Clearly from one data point of weather phenomena, I'm not going to determine whether there is or isn't global warming. What it was, was an example of confirmation bias. He clearly doesn't buy global warming, saw an event that supported his hypothesis, and took it, right? That's the danger. So in all the different regressions I'm going to show you, uh, sometimes they agreed with people's preconceived notions, sometimes they didn't. The danger is if you are rejecting those results out of hand that don't agree with you and only taking the ones that do, right? That's searching out that information that's consistent with your beliefs. It's something to watch out for and be conscious of. So this is my attempt at an unabridged collection of all the electron scattering extractions. I'm sure I've missed some. I try to add them. Um, the, whoops, the frequency of the results has increased greatly since the beginning of the puzzle. 
So if I go back to Luhan 1963, a relatively small radius was extracted from the data. As you go along, we have results coming from Mainz. One of the most interesting ones, as you go through all these various papers, I find is Euler's paper. It's actually the most cited on this entire list. Not because it was a radius extraction, but because it's an early theoretical work uh, that's going to lead uh, to chiral perturbation theory. So this is a theoretical extraction. And what's interesting, if I look along the time axis and look at other similar extractions where people have pushed those ideas um, to dispersively prove chiral effective the field theory, I mean, there's a tremendous amount of progress from 1976 to today. Um, papers like Lynn, Alarcon, they are actually kind of logically building up from that earlier work. So theoretically, there's actually always been it's like conventional nuclear physics pushing at the lower radii. Um, though there are certainly many, many extractions uh, going the other way, done many different ways. Um, I'll just show a few. This is quite a collection of papers, and it's a lot of fitting, a lot of extrapolating, a lot of different functions, a lot of very interesting ideas uh, presented along the way. In, in XKCD terms, this is the, my colleague is wrong, and I can finally prove it. So a simple example, and this is the example that got me interested in the puzzle. I had never done a proton radius extraction. I had no time uh, to even get into it. Uh, I did have a summer intern, so I handed him uh, some early experimental data, um, some from uh, Saskatoon, Canada, other from Mainz, 1980, 1974. We discussed fitting routines, we discussed extrapolating, and I sent him on his way. Um, I was sure he was going to come back to my office uh, with a large radius, and I was shocked when he came back. He just did his thing. He did some regressions. Uh, he did a two-parameter fit. He did a three-parameter fit. He saw no improvement in chi-squared, determined that adding another parameter would be overfitting, and he got his result. And oddly enough, or amazingly enough, he got a result that was consistent with a small radius. Like, weird. What's going on? So that brought me to the absolutely incredible Mainz data set. This is from Bernauer and others. 1,422 cross-section points. Uh, this is my attempt to plot them all on one plot. So this is plot versus Q squared. Uh, the different colors are the different beam energies they used. So they have six different beam energies, a wide variety of angles. And one fun fact to remember, experimentally, if I go to a fixed beam energy, like we have for an experiment, I can't go back past 180 degrees. So for every beam energy, there is highest Q squared you can possibly get. That's why these functional forms are going off the page. That's just the experimental limit in Q squared I can get to uh, with the equipment. So you can see those limits. So with the higher beam energies, I can get to higher Q squareds. And there's certainly many pitfalls as I get back to those extreme back angles. Um, we know nowadays that two photon effects come in uh, and there are other problems as the rates get extremely low as I go to very backwards angle. Nevertheless, this is absolutely beautiful data and much to the credit of Bernauer and his colleagues, they did a beautiful job of publishing it and providing it to the community. So we could all look at it, study it, understand it. When Bernauer did his regression of that data and he obtained a proton radius of 0.88 femtometers, so He did a regression with two 10th order polynomials and 31 floating normalization parameters. This is what two 10th order polynomials plugged into that cross-section formula look like. I did not type this in. It should look horrible. And this, I think, is where Enrico Fermi would probably be screaming at us. Do we have any physical meaning in two 10th order polynomials? in GE that have been squared? Probably not. 
but you can certainly do the regression. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, this result, if you do the fits this way, you shall get uh, the result they published. No doubt. It's been repeated many times by many people. One thing you can look at with that data is what is the radius you get as you change the order of the polynomial fits? And you can go to very silly fits. We'll just do line, quadratic, cubic, quartic, etc. And look, that's, that is the radius you would extract from that data, increasing the order of the polynomial fit in G, GE and GM by the same amount each time. And you get two plateaus, or what may be a plateau. Um, this is where things like confirmation bias can really bite you. Because if you look at this and go, oh, I want to see, or you subconsciously are going, I want to see this result. You may go, oh, fourth order polynomial. This is versus chi squared. Uh, it's not that great. And maybe you say to yourself, well, maybe they've underestimated their uncertainties. What would it take to make the reduced chi square this close to one? It's a tiny increase in the uncertainties in those data points. On the other hand, you could look at this and go, hey, these guys do a phenomenal job. They fit with a mathematical function that's very unconstrained. This is what they get. They've put in their best uncertainties. And there are many, many discussions that have happened over the years on this using this function, other functions, and we could probably go around in circles forever discussing. Another fun thing to do. So in my table of results, the early one, very famous, Lou Han, 1963, proton charge radius result, 0.81. Every number that you need is provided in that paper. If you take that paper, and try to reproduce, reproduce that result, you won't. Uh, this is a very recent paper uh, done with my friends in uh, Slovenia. We literally just take the data that's in the paper and try to reproduce the result. This is what Lou Hand reported. If you just refit it, you will get a larger radius. Um, we then tried different things to try to understand what may have happened in his extraction. Uh, so we tried different fit types, quadratic, cubic. We tried a rational function, the Pade. Our best guess was there was a sign error uh, when he did the original fit. That was the only way we were able to reproduce the result was to actually force a minus sign that wasn't actually there. But that that is lost to history. The only thing that's interesting is you can take that paper and you don't get the result. And as far as I know, it took until 2020 for anyone to notice that the 1963 paper radius was not a reproducible result. And again, this is just taking the procedure as stated in the paper. You will not reproduce the result. So I showed you some different techniques. I suspect at this point you can go, oh goodness, if I'm going to do the extrapolations and I'm just picking functions, I probably can get whatever I want, which is not a good thing. Um, uh, an idea came to several of us, and I, I credit uh, John uh, Zihung um, for actually giving me the, the idea. Um, they had done a global fit, and in that global fit, they had fixed the radius to the current codata value of the time. It was one of their input parameters in the analysis. At the same time, there was a theoretical paper came from Jose Alarcon, Christian Weiss in 2018, using dispersively improved Carl effective theory. And their work was expanded in radius. I, their unknown parameter was the radius. So the idea hit us. This actually was in the back room of the Holly County House, Zihung and myself. Hey, why don't we redo the global fit? So it's this exact same fit. But instead of just fixing the radius to the codata value, let's run through and just fix the global fit to all kinds of different values. 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.10, 0 0.11, 0 0.12, 0 0.13, 0 0.14, 0 0.15, 0 0.16, 0 0.17, 0 0.18, 0 0.19, 
0 0.81, 0 0.82. We just tried them all. We got our set. Done. We then asked our theorist friends, so Jose and Christian, can you take your model and generate us curves for different radii? And then we'll just compare. And we called this the Goldilocks technique. So is there a value of radius where the global fit without any make changes other than fixing this radius? And the theoretical model agree. And we turn that into this animation. So the global fit is in yellow. Here's the theoretical model. You can see the radius clicking by. One thing that might strike you is that in the global fit, it doesn't look like it's moving. Well, if you zoom into this corner, the radius is changing. The slope of the form factor at zero is changing. So from the last data point to unity, there's infinitesimal little changes going on. You can't see it. It is tiny. And that's part of the problem with the extrapolations. It's very challenging to get the result if you're going to do the extrapolation to a Q squared of zero from the world data. On the other hand, with my theoretical model in hand, I can certainly make a very clear statement that in the context of the dispersively improved chiral effective field theory, it is consistent. with a radius around 0.84 femtometers. And that's a standard nuclear physics type calculation. In a seven animation, this is just how that looks. So taking the theoretical model, global fit, both of them have been fixed to the exact same radii and just comparing the two. What I thought was even more fun was to go back and do the exact same thing with the analysis from Mainz. So this is their spline fit of their 1,422 points in GE. And if we compare that to the theoretical model, the best agreement was at 0.845 femtometer and not 0.88. This is their result. And if you zoom in to the very low Q squared, there is a small kink or small, almost discontinuity. Kink maybe is a better word. Um, that gives you the larger radius. But the general behavior is consistent with the smaller radius in the context of that theoretical model. So taking this one step further, we took the dispersely improved chiral effective field theory and applied it to the entire uh, Mainz data set. So did refits with all 31 normalization parameters, et cetera. Uh, and this is the result we got for both the charge and magnetic radius now, so 0 0.84, uh, 0.85. Uh, so electric radius is smaller than the original result. Uh, magnetic is bit bigger. Uh, then we also took the very nice uh, rebin data. This is from, I believe, Arrington, Hill, and Lee. Um, they had taken the Mainz data, rebinned it, did a very nice analysis to determine the uncertainty of the data using the data itself. I thought it was very clever. And we redid the fit. And here's where you might have a little bit of confirmation bias. Boom, you reduce chi squared of one, beautiful result. More important, this is just what we did. Original Mainz data set, the Rebin data set. The results as far as radii are the same or very similar. You reduce chi squared. If this was the truth, true model, it would imply that the analysis of Arrington Hill and Lee nailed the uncertainties. But of course, I don't know that I have the true model in my hand. So there must be some way out of here, said the joker to the thief. There's too much confusion. I can get no relief. So we wanted to go back. Is there some way to really explain what's going on? Is there some simple thing I could understand? Why are those 10th order polynomials, when you fit the Mainz data set, giving the large radius? In some of these other analyses, the chiral effective theory, giving the smaller one. Uh, so we wrote a paper in the end, how analytic choices can affect the extraction. And what we did is we wanted to change just one thing. So to do exactly the Mainz analysis, there are 1,200 points, two 10th order polynomials, 31 normalization parameters, but make one change. And the change, 
that we made is we did a boundary regression where we forced the terms to alternate signs. This is what you would naively expect if you asked the theorist how those terms should go. Negative, positive, negative, positive. That would be consistent with chiral effective theory, other things. So one change. And that one change immediately shifts the radius. That's hard to see in this plot. It's easier to see here. And what really struck me was I was expecting to see something clearly jump out of the electric form factor. It was actually the magnetic that had a more dramatic effect. So this is a ratio of the form factors, electric and magnetic, the unbound regressions, which would be the original Mainz results, divided by dipole. So that's the dash lines, electric and magnetic, and applying the bound. So the only bound is have the signs of the polynomial alternate that causes the function to be smoother. And it makes it apparent, oh, looks like the magnetic is wiggling. Is that physical? I don't think so. But the, the conclusion is certainly that caused a change. And because of all these floating normalizations, this shift in the magnetic affects the electric. You can see how they both shifted. They both shifted in, and that's why those two radii came together. So the original Mainz result had a large charge radius and a small magnetic, making the signs alternate, brought them closer together, and also smoothed out these functions. Another fun trick, or perhaps not a trick, but a technique uh, that's used in doing the regressions is something called robust regressions. When I showed uh, the earlier example of the series of points with one outlier, if you do an ordinary least squares regression, which is what we've been doing thus far, you would get this dashed line, which doesn't fit anything very well. Because in a least squares regression, a single point can easily pull the entire fit. Uh, so there are techniques called robust regressions, which de-weight points that are far away. So it doesn't throw away anything, and you mathematically define how your robust regression is going to work. It's no longer unique, uh, but it's clear what you've done. And applying the exact same robust least squares regression uh, to the results uh, from Mainz, from Miha, um, with their initial state radiation, you actually will shift the radius directly between large and small. And if you stare at this, you'll notice that their ordinary least squares regression is pulled by one point, and when you do the robust, that pulling no longer happens. That's not to say what's right or wrong. It's literally just looking at it with two different regressions, and you go, oh, wow, I am very sensitive to a particular data point, and this would be a point. Perhaps you'd want to go back and remeasure in this region and see, hey, is that real or was the trend line up here? And nice result. This is brand new. This is from Tyler Hegg, uh, the postdoc on the PRAD experiment. We've been investigating, or he's been investigating, uh, Q squared fits versus uh, Z transformation uh, regressions. And he's gone back to an example from Krauss et al. Uh, this is published in Physical Review C. Um, they took the Arrington Mellon Chuck Chung parameterization. In this Krauss paper, they generate pseudo data. Since you know the input parameterization, now you know what truth is because you've controlled it all, and you do fits with different functions. This is a reproduction of the Krauss work. So you generate pseudo data out to some Q squared and try to fit it with different functions. Of course, I go large Q squared trying to fit linear is just silly. Quartic. And what are you seeing? Why is he, I see this narrow band. What you're seeing is a trade-off going on between variance and bias. So if I just look at one of these fits, the quartic, for example, up to a Q squared of 0.1, it doesn't have a bias. It has very large width or large variance. If you keep using that same mathematical function, adding more and more data points, at some point you'll be underfitting and the variance will start to go down, but your bias, 
the offset from truth starts increasing. This is standard bias variance trade-off, a uh, well-known phenomena in regressions. The problem, of course, is with real data, I don't know truth. So the typical thing to do is exactly what Krauss did. You generate pseudodata using a mathematical function that you believe is close to truth, do tests, figure out which mathematical functions would be appropriate for your data. So if I had data that went out to Q squared 0.2, or maybe 0.15, quartic, cubic, you could decide. He then did the exact same thing uh, using the conformal mapping. Uh, this is taking Q squared, which runs from 0 to infinity, do a conformal mapping, so it goes from 0 to 1, do the fits, unbound, uh, this is what you get. It's actually much worse. So what in what you're seeing, so let's go to this quartic example here at the very high Q squared. So variance is tiny, bias is huge. It's now made the variance huge and the bias smaller. But you can see for all these fits, the variance is very large. Uh, this is the unbound. Um, typical uh, Z transformation regressions to extract proton radius also include uh, theoretical bound. Uh, so, so the next thing that will be done by Tyler, he's going to add the bound, uh, redo uh, the fits in Z, and at the same time he's also going to add the bound in Q squared, the alternating sign in the terms, and that's coming soon. So th this is literally from today, he just made these. So chugging along. Okay, and the last experiment I want to mention today from electron scattering is the PRAD experiment. This is the one that did not use a magnetic spectrometer, so they have a target. Um, this is a vacuum chamber. They just detect, they know the energy of the beam coming in, they have a target, measure the angles going out. That's all I need to determine Q squared from elastic scattering. Uh, so a relatively straightforward, simple experiment, at least on paper. Of course, it's always a challenge uh, setting up an enormous vacuum chamber, adding these uh, wire chambers or gem chambers. And one thing that I thought was very important is that the experiment determined what function they're going to fit the data with before they saw the experimental data. Um, so using the idea of pseudo data and taking many, many different parameterizations from the absurdly simple monopole, uh, dipole, Gaussian, uh, to some of the modern parameterizations um, from Z Hung, Bernauer, Alarcon, was there a simple mathematical functions that could robustly extract the radius. Regardless of what that input radius was, were there functions that always worked? And the simplest one that would work uh, was a rational 1-1. One, one. This looks like a line divided by a line if you're not familiar with that function. And it is equivalent to the continued fraction of second order. These are actually, we re rediscovered the wheel in playing with our Monte Carlo. They are mathematically equivalent functions. So what we were trying to do is not find a function that had no bias or no variance, but find functions that had little variance and bias overall and not explode either quantity. So before seeing the data, generate pseudo data with the error bars that were expected and determine what function we we're going to use. This was done. My good friend Jerry Miller said, that's nonsense. You can't do that. He said, Jerry, okay, send us some fake GE data sets where only you know what the radius is. He did this. Uh, he's happy to do it. Uh, if you have a function you'd like to try out, this is a completely blind validation test. Jerry's the only one who knows the answer. He sent us uh, pseudo data. We fit it using, this is pseudo data with the same uncertainties and spacing as was expected from PRAD. We made use of that rational 1-1 one, one function. We sent him back the answer and he was like, oh wow. So. From a blind test, we were able to tell the two radii he had cooked up in his theoretical model. And this is what the data looks like from PRAD, and this is the fit result they got. So 0 0.831 statistical error 0.007. So again, consistent with the smaller radius. Okay, there's certainly a lot more going on in the story than the electron scattering. That's just my specialty, so it's what I focused on. Certainly a lot of effort went into getting new atomic lamb shift data as well. 
one thing I found interesting. So this is the data that drove the original atomic lamb shift result uh, from CoData. Um, this is straight averaging, even though some of these events or experiments were correlated using the same equipment. You could already question whether this band's a little bit smaller than it should be. Nevertheless, it's what you get. People went back, have redone those results, and for the moment, the one that carries the most weight is one from our Canadian colleagues, actually sitting here in this photograph. Uh, they not only did an atomic lamp shift experiment, what made theirs a step above the rest, they actually had a blinded analysis. So until they unblinded, they had no idea what the radius would be, and they got 0.833, so significantly smaller than previous hydrogen lamp shift experiments. And these are also results that have changed the Rydberg constant. So amazing thing. So if I go back to the very beginning where all the different hypotheses, I don't think anyone was thinking that, oh, both atomic hydrogen lamp shift data and electron scattering data were likely offset and we'd be shifting the Rydberg constant. That's where we've come. Um, everything isn't perfect, um, probably never is. Um, uh, there has been another result that got these uh, smaller radius, but there is result from 2018 uh, with the larger from Paris group. So still investigating, understanding what's going on. Which brings us to new recommended values. So over the years, CoData 2014 had as the recommended values for the proton radius and the Rydberg constant. And by 2018, they had shifted. And this is not just a statistical shift, this is a systematic shift. Um, basically, at this point, shifting the null hypothesis or the belief that the muonic lamb shift experiment is indeed measuring the correct proton radius value. And particle data group has also changed its recommendation. So, summary and outlook, a lot of effort has gone into understanding the proton radius puzzle. Looking deeply into the analysis of old data as well as new data. Uh, we have the new PRAD, no spectrometer experiment, uh, new lamp shift results, and there's more coming. Um, MUSE is presently underway, running. We look forward to seeing their results. Uh, new data will be coming from the A1 collaboration, MESA, COMPASS, and a second generation of the PRAD experiment has passed its experimental readiness review. So there shall be a lot more data. We shall have a deep understanding of what's going on. We'll continue to push to low Q squared, getting rid of the extrapolation problem. And nature very well may have surprises in store for us, but at the moment it looks like smaller radius is the most likely hypothesis at the moment, and it is explained with conventional nuclear physics, uh, making use of theories such as chiral uh, effective field theory. So I leave it to you all to decide if the puzzle is solved or not. There's certainly more data coming, so still exciting times. And for those of you who just like fitting because fitting is fun, I took one of the XKCD comics and redid all the fits. You can go online, look at that in Python, just fun. And I'll take any questions. Thank you. Excellent. Douglas, thank you very much. These are great. Okay, Andre, um, you have a question? Sure. First, I was just clapping, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> I I appreciate you talk very much. Uh, I just had one thought that popped in my head as you were talking, uh, you know, when you're talking about the regression and you have one data point pulling your fit. And so then you go and re-examine that data point. Of course, that also can lead you into potential problems because you're only re-examining <laughs> subsets of things that look bad no absolutely it what is nice actually and it, I'll, I'll use this uh i'll pick on my my good friend miha from slovenia uh, this is his data set the fact that you can do the ordinary least squares regression and then turn around and do a perfectly normal robust least squares regression and get a different result it's hinting that the data is not normally distributed. But you're right, you can you can definitely fall into, I don't know, 
down the, the rabbit hole, you know, if you start staring at certain points or, or wondering what's going on. I think the main message to go is, wait a minute, if this data was normally distributed, uh, these two regressions would give the same answer. So it is a little bit about, let's say, looking for hints, look, looking for problems, but not let's say, getting too wrapped up and going, oh, if you do this, I'll, I'll get the answer I like. That is where it goes very, very wrong. You definitely need to step back and go, hey, the ordinary least squares regression is a perfectly natural thing to do. It gives a larger radius. If I do a different technique, I get a different answer. Why? And so maybe the actual question, could you, is there a quick way to, to describe the robust regression versus ordinary? Sure. So in the uh, least squares, uh, so as you go far away, that one point will cause your chi-squared to just explode. So the only thing that happens in the re robust regressions is it de-weights that. And there's presumably some algorithm for yeah, de-weighting. Yeah, I, I should have written the formula down and I, okay. I'm not, I'm going to fail miserably to, to say it out loud. But uh, if, you, if you go to the paper, it's it's spelled out exactly how, how to do that. Okay, great. Thank you. So, uh, numerical Recipes has a really nice chapter on robust regressions. Uh, the only problem with them is they aren't unique. You can, how you want to de-weight the points can change. So that, that, you know, searching for a technique that gives an answer you like is horrible. Yeah. All right, thank you again. Douglas, on slide, on slide about 40, um, when you were talking about the two different functions, there was the continued fraction, which ended up, oh no, maybe it was 39, mm -hmm. um, which ended up being equivalent to, uh, what was it called, n equals m equals 1, the rational, and you said it's two lines. Can you show me what do you, what does that function actually look like? I can't picture oh, it. So just, um, I should have written more formulas. So just imagine a polynomial function of an order. Uh, so the N is the order of the polynomial function. So first order, so linear. Okay. The M is the denominator, which is also just a polynomial of order one, so linear. So mathematically, it looks like the equation of a line divided by the equation of a line. What's cute about that function is you take that and you make these beautiful curves. It, it, this is a well-known extrapolating function. Okay. And the continued fraction? Sorry, were you going to say something else? Oh, I, I was going to mention one thing because you, you, you look at this uh, rational function and you may go, oh, it's devoid of, say, theoretical meaning. One thing that's really cute, uh, if you look at some of the fits like Jim Kelly's, he took a mathematical function that was basically n equals 1 in the numerator, m equals 3 in the denominator. And when you take that to the limit of q squared of infinity, you get exactly the um, expected q squared to the fourth behavior. So you, you can add terms to this rational and actually make it, um, say, make sense theoretically, which makes it kind of cute. And no, you should go for the continued fraction to see how that looks. I, I would suggest just going to the papers. I'm going to do a horrible job of hand waving how that function that looks like a function inside a function inside a function. Uh, I just studied uh, that thing. It's incredible. These continued fractions, they're absolutely incredible. So I was trying to map that, what I just read about, to this rational function. So I'll look at the paper. Thank you very but, much. But yes, we, we, my, my friend Ingo Sick, um, you know, we, we found this. And he's like, of course you should know that the continued fraction order two is the same as a rational one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I we literally fell into it like, hey, why are these coming out identical? <laughs> Interesting. But yes, it's a it's a mathematical proof. And then, oh, okay, Andre, please, another question. Sure. The I was wondering the chiral effective field theory analysis was that used over the whole range of q squared you showed in your plot or is it only used kind of at the low q squared so for um i i have used it over the whole range of q squared q squared of one which makes uh jose and christian cringe um if you go to their published paper um 
out to a Q squared of a half, um, Jeff squared is what they were comfortable with. But just comparing their uh, theoretical model to the experimental data, it works amazingly well, perhaps better than it should. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, did you, did you do a study where you looked at the, like the radius as you did a truncation in Q squared using the, the Carla EFT formula? Yeah, but I don't, this is where there's something interesting going on, right? Because I'm taking experimental data and doing a, a regression. So I just stop, right? I have data and I the, I stop the data at some point. So I'm not, let's say the data itself is not affected by a truncation, like a, from an expansion is the data point ends up where it, nature wishes it to be. Um, I guess the other way I would... The other way I might do it is add some theoretical uncertainty into the fit based on where I expect the Kite PT to start failing. Yes, that. Uh, but for the work we've done thus far, we, we it was literally an estimation where they thought their model would start to fail. And I guess what's pretty is that even pushing a factor of two beyond where they thought it would start to fail, it's it's beautifully describing the data. It doesn't do anything weird, funky, nonlinear. Um, and, and I'm sure it's starting to break down. There, there's no reason it, why it should keep going, but they have a well-behaved ma mathematical function. So it, it does a reasonable job over all the Q squares of the mind data. I thought that was pretty cool. All right, thanks. And you can see from these plots, we've pu we pushed pretty far. So, so point, point 0.6, I was, I, was, I was thinking 0.5, it was actually 0.6. I see Wick and, and Dean. Wick, did you have a question? Because I saw you first. Uh, no, I didn't. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Dean. Please ask your question. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm just um, uh, slightly fascinated now by this robust regression because it's the first time I've heard of it. And it looks extremely useful. So I'm just thinking, you know, what is it? What is it really doing here? Is it is it picking up on asymmetries? Because you said, you know, the robust regression can really start to change if your data is not normally distributed. So that. You know, it's kind of sings symmetry to me. So is, you know, is this like picking up some sort of log normal behavior or something like that? Is that what it's hinting at? In other words, can you, can you fish out what kind of distribution your data is coming from if you start comparing this kind of stuff? Because you said it's not new, the robust regression is not unique. So if you can do various different types of robust regression, can you then pick up enough data to try and suggest what distribution your data is coming from? That would be hard. It, and, there, and probably the real problem is that with real experimental data, right, it's systematic problems, or let's say there was a wire in a wire chamber that was running hot, so it caused a certain data point to get shifted. And then I'm combining sets from different um, uh, experiments. So in these global analyses, it's probably the concept that it's perfectly normally distributed to have this, you know, of course, it doesn't hold because of real life problems, but then there are multiple real life problems. And yeah, could you fish out how it's distributed? I don't know. That's a fascinating question. Well, it's a fascinating subject, so now I have to go away and learn about it. So thank you very much. Very good. John? I uh, just, <clears throat> just commenting on this still, I think, um, so, and I put the link to the, the paper, at least the archive version of it on in the chat for people who want to look, but this is, um, it, so, I, so I think just to clarify one point, even, even if you had, so, so this will give you changes if your events are not perfectly Gaussianly distributed, although that can still mean you could do a sample where everything is coming from a Gaussian distribution, but in that one set of data, you happen to get, you know, more outliers. And so there's kind of, there's a knob you turn that tells how how much you want to de-weight outliers. Um, but of course, whether the fact that there are outliers comes from the fact that it's not coming from a Gaussian distribution or just that you had a point with the big excursion, you don't know. And that's why, I think that's why Doug made the point that, that if it's throwing, if it's telling you that some data is an outlier, you don't necessarily just throw it out. You might want to see if you can improve your measurement in that whole region. Yeah, exactly.
Douglas, I had a sort of a naive question back on slide. I think it was nine, nine, which is when you were talking about isolating the electric and magnetic form factors, there was the formula. Oh, yeah. yeah, Douglas, so I don't see, maybe this is very obvious. I can see how you can isolate the magnetic form factor, but I didn't see how you could isolate the electric form factor. Oh, well, let's, let's go ridiculously naive just for Thank a you. second. So if I, if I take, so tau is, yeah, where'd my mouse go? Oh, there we go. Okay, so I've got Q squared. So let's just take that to zero for a second, right? So I got zero, bang, zero, bang, zero. So I'd just be left with GE. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, that's exactly what I And mean. then the, the, the other extreme, you know, make a Q squared very large, then I'll multiply the large number here, then the GE term is negligible. It, and that's, that's all you're seeing. The only thing that's going different here is I've, instead of changing the uh, Q squared, I'm playing with the beam energy, which is, you know, experimentally what I get, I get a particular beam energy and then I show as a function of the scattering angle of the spectrometer. So these plots are very experimental uh, point of view, the, the quantities that we'd set up for an experiment. Yeah, so I was just trying to visualize, you know, why we go to the you know, very back angles uh, to try to pull off the magnetic form factor only, or very forward angles to try to pull off the GE only. So the PRAD experiment, for example, is low beam energy, very small scattering angles. They had a negligible contribution from the magnetic. You practically ignore it. And you're certainly insensitive to the choice of magnetic form factor parameterization you put in. You now, for a lot of experiments, we sit sort of in between. And then we do this so called Rosenblut separation, where you use different beam energies to go to the exact same Q squared and then pull the two form factors apart, or do it in a global fit. So yeah, simple simple formula, and you can actually this one, you know, the elastic scattering formula for a spin one half particles. So very interesting. Thank you very much. So, do we have any other questions? Thank okay. So, Douglas, thanks very much again for a great talk, and I will see everyone next time. All right. Well, thank you very much. I enjoyed myself. I'm going to try to stop. I, I can barely see the moon now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Beautiful moon coming your way in a couple hours. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Um, Xin Yan, if you're still here, can you stop the recording? Would you? I don't think I can do it. Yeah. Okay. I guess I'm going to have to sort of leave the meeting. Doug, that was a great talk. Thank you. That was awesome. I feel like I understand what's going on better now. And I think it's, yeah, it, the puzzle is solved, except I think it's going to, I mean, it, it ha the radius is 0. 0.83. I always have been using 0. 0.84, like the uh, particle data booklet says, but it sounds to me like it's going to go down. Um, well, this is where it could get cool, right? Mm -hmm. Because let's say at some level, you, the, the question is longer between this 0 0.88 and 0 0.84, but now you, now you maybe, and this is the reason why, at least in my mind, why I'm so excited to do things like PRAD2, we're going to push the precision of the, of the scattering experiments to the point to see, is there really maybe a different discrepancy creeping in? I was thinking that a baby a proton radius pu puzzle, a new yes. one. Yes, but, but one much, much, much smaller than before. And yes, there, there absolutely could be subtle things going on. Um, two photon corrections could still be playing a, a role. It just wasn't you know, as big. Mm. So yeah, no, there, it'll be interesting to see if everything really just reconciles or uh, there's still homework to do on, on the muonic side or electron side or both. Yeah, we'll see. And when you guys were writing up the proposal for PRAD2, was this like a main feature of it to just determine if it's 0.84 or 0.8 or just to like get down to the precise? Get, get down to a precision where you could, re instead of just saying, because initially it was this very large discrepancy. So you, yeah, you need to do a good job, but maybe not ultimate precision. PRAD2 is literally like, okay, if we do the pretty much the best job we could possibly do, add multiple wire chambers so we can do better vertexing, get rid of the backgrounds, et cetera. How far can we push the air bar? So take the PRAD point, take another factor of four or five out of that uncertainty. Um, you'll never be, let's say, as uh, 
precise as the muonic lamb shift. Um, but if there's something systematic going on, you'll start to get to a precision where you'd actually see it with statistical significance. Right? And that's what makes it fun. Because, yeah, you, usually things aren't as easy as <laughs> we think. So Yeah, yeah there, there is a hint. In, yeah, you picked up on it. And when is it when is it when is it gonna run? When is PRAD two gonna run? Oh wow, well, I don't know. Okay. It's a it's an odd energy for Jefferson Lab. It's a, a low energy, so probably end up running I can imagine by itself with one Linac. So we go in kind of a low energy uh, mode when there's time. Mm -hmm. It's also less expensive to run the machine with just one one linear accelerator and almost all the dipole magnets turned off. So okay. it's that racetrack okay. machine. It, it is not cheap just to turn on all the magnets. Um, so we have done this kind of summer running mode. Yeah. I, I suspect that's when it will come. So, okay. I always tell the experimentalists just get their experiment ready and just I'm ready. <laughs> Anytime, right? It, you'll get scheduled. Some, something always happens. So it's always great to have you know experiments that are ready to go on the floor, um, and something bad happens to another experiment. Not that I wish ill on anyone, but no, of right? course, no. But but you need you need the backups, right? Because it's, I don't know. So. Your polarized helium three glass it turns out to all been bad. Your cells aren't polarizing. We need to put something else on the floor. Be right to now. Exactly. Right. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, let me see. I have a chat. Who was chatting with us? Oh, Dean just said thanks for the lo the link. Okay, cool. Okay, I will let you go. I'll wait for the moon. Thanks. <laughs> that was awesome. It was such a good talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. I enjoyed myself. Okay, I'll see you soon. Ciao.